All right. This is case CR 22211623, State v. Chad Guy Daybell. Mr. Daybell is here present in court with his attorney, Mr. Pryor, representing the state for the prosecution, Lindsey Blake and Rob Wood. Also, Ms. Rawlings and Ms. Smith are all present. This is the time scheduled on a motion hearing that's been filed by the defense. On September 7th, the defense filed its motion to sever from death notice co-defendant in order to enforce Mr. Daybell's constitutional rights. Thereafter, the state filed its response on October 6th, and then a supplemental brief was filed by the state on October 12th. The court's reviewed the briefing that's been submitted in this case, and it's scheduled for oral argument this morning. Mr. Pryor will be presenting argument, I presume, on behalf of his client, Mr. Daybell, and who is going to be arguing today for the state? I will be, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Mr. Pryor, are you ready to proceed with your argument? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Is the state ready to proceed as well? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Pryor, then you can present argument in support of your motion. I'm disappointed the lectern's not here today, but I'll stand up if that's okay with the court. Judge, I want to start out by pointing out I chose not to file a responsive brief after reviewing both of the, my original brief and the state's brief. I think I addressed all of the concerns I had in the original. I won't be standing up. I'll just sit down, Judge. That might be the best way. Okay. Then I'll start again, Judge, if that's okay. Judge, I would like to point out that I had indicated I may have been responding or providing a responsive brief. I chose not to do that. I think, quite frankly, the issues that I brought up in my original motion and brief are detailed enough to support my position that the cases should be severed. Judge, there are a couple of things, and this is in regards to just federal cases. It's not an uncommon phenomenon for federal capital crimes cases to be severed. And the reason for that is that the heightened amount of scrutiny that is applied in terms of every step of the proceedings, because of the result could be that a defendant is put to death. So given that severity of consequence, the courts and the federal courts have always made it almost a habit of severing capital crimes cases. Well, I will apply that analogy to this case as well, Judge, because we're talking about a significant criminal case. We're talking about a significant criminal case that has drawn a tremendous amount of public attention. Also in this case, there's a significant amount of information. Part of that information is the evidence that's related locally to this case. But the other half of this, Judge, is that there's been a lot of public attention drawn to the actions of Lori Vallow and her brother Adam. Mr. Cox, I know I just stumbled, excuse me. Her brother, her brother, Mr. Cox, Alex Cox, excuse me. I didn't want to say the other brother. So I was Alex Cox down in Arizona. Judge, there are pending charges down in Arizona. There are allegations down in Arizona. And quite frankly, there was a documentary that was done by Netflix that portrayed this case in a way I don't necessarily agree with. In fact, I don't agree with it. But they portrayed and displayed it. And that Netflix series was, I think, the number one show on that particular media type all over the United States. It got a tremendous amount of attention. And unfortunately, down in Arizona, they have elected to make public a lot of the discovery, a lot of the text messages, a lot of the emails, a lot of the police reports. And a lot of those items were displayed on this Netflix special. And as part of this Netflix special, they talked about the allegations and what Ms. Vallow was allegedly involved in down in Arizona. Now, it is my intention, and I discussed that in this brief. I am going to be petitioning this court per the rule and asking the court to allow me to use a certain amount of information as it relates to allegations down in Arizona. I fully intend to go down there. And my reading of the rule is 404B in bad acts 
uh, generally applies to the prosecutor's obligation and the defense is generally not under that obligation, but just to, to, to play it safe, I'm going to ask the court to consider a number of allegations and actions that have taken place down in Arizona. And there's going to be, I'm sorry, Judge, I saw you had a. Well, I just, on the 404B issue, as the state raised in their response, if, if that's one of the basis for this motion to sever, I mean, are we even right to hear the motion? Because 404B is clearly going to require a pretrial hearing and ruling to even determine whether or not 404B comes in, if there's any evidence out there. And at this stage in the case, we haven't had any rulings on any 404B evidence or any motions specifically asking or for that to either be admitted or to be excluded in the case. And Judge, I, I, I will acknowledge that I have not filed any 404B motions, but if you look at Rule 404B, that rule is designed to put on the prosecutor the burden of presenting bad acts that they intend to use um, uh, against a defendant and get a court ruling prior to trial as to whether they're, not, whether they're going to be allowed or not to be allowed to do that. So I guess I'm, I'm using 404B in a loose manner. If you have your clerk or your legal assistant check, she will find out that 404B generally is applied to just the prosecuting attorney. It's not necessarily applied and isn't applied to a defendant. And if this defendant chooses to go after a potential witness who's now deceased, uh, who they're going to use information about Alex Cox, and if I'm going to be permitted to present evidence about Lori Vallow I don't necessarily, at least from my reading, I don't necessarily have to seek a 404B ruling. So it's, this is, this is ripe to hear this, Judge, because I don't have to do it. I can call witnesses and I can present evidence about Lori Vallow all day long and Alex Cox all day long. And if this prosecutor wants to object, you know, he can tell me what rule it is that he that keeps that out because it goes to bias. It goes to a number of issues under the rules, and I am going to be permitted, at least I believe I'm going to be permitted to present that. Now, that creates a problem. And the problem that it creates, Judge, is this, is that Mr. Archibald and Mr. Thomas, I suspect, are in all likelihood going to try to limit the amount of evidence as it relates to allegations in Arizona. I can't speak for what Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald are going to do, but I know that if I were representing Ms. Vallow, I would want to streamline this trial and not allow much of that information because it would, it would potentially incriminate Ms. Vallow and the nature of what she's done throughout her life. Now, I, if they're going to accuse my client of being involved with Ms. Vallow to the extent that there was some sort of plan to commit a murder, I clearly can bring in information about Ms. Vallow and Alex Cox to dispute what this prosecutor thinks he might have. I don't have to get permission under 404B, Judge. I can do that under the rules and pursue that. So again, this is, this is a, a hearing that it, this is a ripe uh, motion. But what's going to happen is we're going to get into this conflict, and what's going to happen is this case is going to turn into a evidentiary nightmare. And that evidentiary nightmare is going to be the court's going to have to balance the constitutional rights of Lori Vallow against the rights of Mr. Daybell to present a defense to the allegations in this case. And Mr. Daybell, in a capital murder crime, has a right to present a vigorous and complete defense to the allegations. Ms. Vallow has a right to have a fair trial and be permitted to exclude evidence that may be prejudicial to her. And the problem is, is there's going to have to be a balance. At what point do we say, well, Mr. Daybell, we're not going to let this information in, even though it, it stops you from providing a complete defense. And Ms. Vallow, we're not going to let this information in because we understand that it's a, uh, a violation of your, your rights. So information that I want, and I'm using the Arizona as an example, Judge, there's, there's other information that's out there, and, and uh, um, I, you know, I'm hesitant to discuss discovery and, and those things, and I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll restrain myself. But, Judge, there's information that's going to cause this conflict, and it's going to continue to cause this conflict throughout this case. The other concern I have, Judge, is that in the event there is a conviction of either of these parties, there's going to have to be some sort of mitigation evidence that's going to be presented. 
And that mitigation evidence is we're talking about someone in, the, in, in Lori Vallow's case has not spent a considerable amount of time in eastern Idaho, uh, as opposed to Mr. Daybell, who's been here the better of 30 years of his life, 20, I'm sorry, Utah and Arizona, 30 years of his life. And there's going to be some information, there's going to be some information that's going to need to be presented in terms of mitigation. If it goes that route, that's going to cause a, a conflict. So the ag antagonistic defense that we, uh, that, that in all likelihood that's going to occur here, Judge, is, is problematic. The other issue, Judge, is that, um, I don't think this is a big surprise to anyone, but the defense that I'm presenting is not the defense that, uh, at least from my knowledge, that Lori Vallow is presenting. And we have antagonistic defenses. Our version of the, the, the facts of this case will differ greatly from what Ms. Vallow and her legal counsel are going to be presenting. Again, that provides and, and concerns me in terms of evidentiary issues, and it's a big concern. Ms. Vallow has not waived her speedy trial right. Mr. Daybell did waive his speedy trial right, and this case, court vacated the trial. Um, that, again, also creates concerns. And lastly, Judge, uh, I touched on this a little bit in the brief, and I want to talk a little bit about gender stereotyping. And in gender stereotyping, I touched on the statistics that show a vast number of defendants, when there is a male and a female defendant, and you're dealing with cases of this magnitude, there's an overwhelming majority of the time that the male gets convicted and is, is sentenced to death, and the female is, 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 is afforded a lesser, uh, a lesser sentence. I'm deeply concerned that in having both of those people here at the same time, that we're going to have some difficulties with that. Judge, I, I, up front, I took a significant amount of time to, um, to detail what my concerns were in the, in the memorandum that I submitted. I've touched on this briefly. I, I don't want to turn this into a, a, a long, drawn-out uh, presentation, but I would ask the court to review that again. And I hit the high points of, of the concerns that I have as to why I believe the matter should be uh, severed. And I would respectfully ask the court to, to sever these cases. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. I do have a, a couple of questions. I mean, as I see the arguments, they're, they sort of fall into two categories. One would be trial issues. One is sentencing issues. Um, quite frankly, I think some of the sentencing issues that have been raised are at this point causing me a little more concern maybe than the trial issues. I say that not that I've made any determination yet, but in terms of the potential trial issues, looking at the history of where we are with this, the court did previously uh, issue a memorandum decision in March of this year denying a motion for severance. And in that decision, I specifically referenced um, well, first of all, it's the burden of the defendant to demonstrate severance should occur in this case because of the joinder order that's already issued. But with that burden in mind, under Criminal Rule 14, in discussing whether or not there is prejudice in the joinder, uh, it states that the, uh, the rule says the court may order the attorney for the state to deliver to the court for inspection in camera any statements or confessions made by the defendants and I addressed that in that prior decision about whether or not there were uh, confessions in this case because some of your uh, argument rests on the proposition that there have been confessions made which may raise brutal issues and other antagonistic defense issues and confrontation issues. Um, I still, at this time, am not aware of any evidence in the case of any confessions that have occurred. So... Um, is it your understanding that there are confessions and do those need to be reviewed by the court in an in-camera interview in making this determination? Because I think the states clearly indicated there are not confessions and I don't uh, typically review evidence, but that rule allows me to do so. And the question then is whether or not you think there are confessions out there that are going to interfere with your client's ability to have a fair trial if these cases remain joined. So I know that was a long question, but that is... My main inquiry here is, are there, in fact, confessions that need to be reviewed by the court in an in-camera hearing? To my knowledge, there are no confessions as it relates to the allegations, and maybe I wasn't as, as clear as I should have been, and I'll clarify my response. 
There are no confessions that I'm aware of as it relates to the allegations in this particular case. What there are, Judge, is there are multiple statements by both parties and multiple comments by both parties that at this point I don't know whether the state's going to be using those statements or comments to support their case, and there are a number of them. In addition, Judge, there are a number of comments and statements and interviews as it relates to the Arizona case. Now, Mr. Daybell, in the wisdom of the Arizona prosecutor, uh, he obviously made it public that there was uh, no chance that Mr. Daybell could even be convicted of anything down in Arizona, nor do I believe that he had any information that would suggest Mr. Daybell was even involved in anything down in Arizona. Otherwise, there'd be a criminal charge that he'd be facing. Uh, but there are allegations in Arizona and statements made by not only Alex Cox, I got it right, and, um, and um, Lori Vallow, and there are numerous statements and interviews and evidence, and potentially those things are going to call, cause problems. Now, are those brutal, brutal issues as they relate to confessions? And we draw a very narrow definition of what brutal is in this case? No, Judge, there's no brutal issues as it relates to only confessions. However, what there are, there are a number of statements and a number of comments, and, and there are brutinesque comments that potentially cause problems. And it's just as simple as getting on the Internet and downloading the information in Arizona, and you will see that there are a number of things that are uh, potentially going to cause problems. Uh, given the uh, some of the previous court's rulings, I've been very hesitant to, to, to specifically address uh, um, specific discovery, and I'm not going to do that. But what I will say, Judge, is that if we take the amount of information that's down there and statements that are part and parcel of what's involved in this case, there are potential problems. And maybe what the court should do is ask the prosecutor to provide a list of all of the statements of most Miss Vallow and Mr. Daybell, what statements, what comments, what communications they intend to use so that the court can make an assessment as to whether there really is a, uh, a potential problem. And I would suggest to the court that there is a potential. No, I would suggest to the court that there is a problem. Not potential problem, there is a problem. Uh, so, uh, Judge, I had no choice after completely going over all the discovery. Mr. Dable and I have talked about this detail. He's nodding his head. Uh, there are problems, and there are difficulties, and it's going to create evidentiary nightmares in this trial if this thing's not severed. All right. Thank you for the argument, then. Mr. Pryor, Ms. Blake, state's response, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll start off by saying the state shares the concerns um, addressed by the court today regarding any argument of mutually antagonistic defenses and evidence that may that is purported to be presented by the defense or that they may present. Uh, this court asked the question about are we premature here having a hearing on a motion to sever where we don't know exactly what that evidence is. We've not had a 404B hearing. We don't have the alleged evidence that may be admitted specifically laid out before this court or for the state. So the state did share that concern, and that's why it was addressed in the brief. Um, we feel that as it sits now, the defendant falls far short of meeting the heavy burden that the courts have repeatedly said a defendant bears. And obviously, if the state were the one requesting to sever based on an issue of prejudice, the state would bear that burden. Uh, generally, it is the defendant that brings that, so the case law is very clear that the moving party, the defendant, uh, bears that heavy burden. So I do think that we may be a little premature here today. I think if the defendant is to meet or attempt to meet a burden regarding severance, we are we should more appropriately be set for an evidentiary hearing wherein some evidence is laid before this court um, and provided to the state for us to fully review how that may have an impact. And the reason the state thinks that is, again, when we look at the heavy burden and we look at what the courts have weighed out in the past to determine whether or not a severance is necessary or mandatory, they are truly looking for a mutually antagonistic defense. And the courts are very clear. That doesn't mean just finger pointing. It doesn't mean that a defendant feels they have a better chance of acquittal if their case is severed from their co-defendant it means that it is essentially a zero-sum game. 
And the state cited to multiple cases where that had been reviewed, some in which a court had determined that essentially it was a zero-sum game and that severance was truly the only available remedy. And that's the other thing that we see as a theme throughout these cases is the courts repeatedly have cited to the case law. And when I say the courts, I am talking about Idaho courts and I am talking about the federal courts. Um, the federal courts truly have reviewed this issue more than the Idaho courts, but it is paramount in those that severance is essentially the last ditch effort. It is meant to be used when there is absolutely no other remedy available to protect whatever manifest prejudice the defendant is claiming will result if the trial isn't severed. And again, that's why it's such a heavy burden. They use the terms manifest prejudice. It's not just a claim of prejudice. It has to be so severe that there is no other remedy than to sever the trials. And so we've seen that happen in a few cases. Um, I was just trying to turn to the right ones. Um, the two... I think one of them uh, that's supportive of severance is a case, um, United States v. Green, and that's actually cited to in United States v. George. It's in our brief, but if the court would like the citation, I can provide that. It is, um, that one's 2019 U.S. District Lexus 150367 or 2019 WL. Four one nine four five two six, and in George they actually review the Green and they contrast that case. In Green, it was a situation in which there were two capital co-defendants. These capital co-defendants were both accused of uh, committing a murder. There was only one shooter, though, and that's what was paramount. Is because there was only one shooter, it resulted in a zero-sum game because both of the co-defendants were going to point the finger at each other. And the court found that it is a zero-sum game if to believe one defendant means that you have to convict the other or vice versa, that the conviction of one results in the acquittal of the other, where you can have no other outcome than those. The court distinguished George from that, however, and George is more applicable to this case. That was differentiated because in George, the government was alleging that all three capital defendants had shot at the victim. And that's what was different, is based on those circumstances, the jury in George did not have to disbelieve the core of one defendant's defense in order to believe the core of the other co-defendant's defense, because there was a third actor. And similarly, uh, we saw that in the case of United States v. Haney, and that is actually cited, well, that site is 2016 U.S., District Lexus 32132. And in that case, um, similarly, there was a potential third individual involved. And so the jury could have found uh, multiple different outcomes, but at the end of the day, because there were other unnamed individuals, they could have been responsible for the misconduct. Similarly, in this case, and even in the argument raised by the defense, the defendant here today, he's saying, I may bring in evidence that Lori and her brother, Alex, were the ones that committed these crimes or were the main ones involved. Well, we don't end up in a zero-sum game. We have a third-party actor here. The jury could find a multiple of different uh, outcomes. They could weigh evidence differently. It doesn't result in, if they believe Chad's story, they have to convict Lori or vice versa. In addition to that, we're at a situation today, we don't know what defense is going to be put on by Ms. Vallow. We don't know that it will be antagonistic at this point in time. Uh, we are without that here today. The defendant also um, has continues to raise that he believes there's an underlying uh, requirement that all standards are heightened when we're dealing with capital cases. The state doesn't disagree that there is case law out there and there have been standards set out that heighten burdens or um, add some additional elements when we are dealing with capital cases. That simply isn't the case when we're dealing with severance. The defendant has failed to cite anything that says a different standard is applied when we look at capital cases. And to the contrary, um, again, looking at that United States v. George case, uh, they have found in particular 
And this is also looking at the potential remedies available. Um, so we talk about severance being the last-ditch effort when there is no other remedy available. What the courts consistently favor is limiting or, in, or um, corrective jury instructions. And that is found throughout the case law where the courts repeatedly say a limiting jury instruction, a jury instruction saying what evidence can be used against what co-defendant, um, what to ignore, that those absolutely cure any potential prejudice. And so those are favored over and over again. We see that. But in George, it said, in particular, instructions to the jury that they must consider the evidence against each defendant separately and individually will alleviate the risk of prejudice. Even in sensitive life and death matters, it is presumed that juries will follow the court's instruction and serve as impartial fact finders. In conspiracy cases involving multiple defendants, the preference for joint trials still applies because courts presume that juries are capable of compartmentalizing the evidence against each defendant. So, and again, those were dealing more, and the, the court has said this is kind of separated into two arguments. We have the guilt um, phase, and then we have the penalty phase. And those cases really deal more with the guilt phase. Um, United States v. Edelin, I would cite to that one as well. Um, 2000, oh, excuse me, 118 F SUP 2D. 36. That is another case that dealt with capital defendants. And again, a federal court found the test for severance is whether the defendants present conflicting and irreconcilable defenses, and there is a danger that the jury will unjustifiably infer that the conflict alone demonstrates that both are guilty. In fact, the doctrine of irreconcilable defenses, mutually antagonistic defenses, is inapplicable where there is independent evidence of each defendant's guilt. And so, and we cite to that case again, because when we're talking about a different standard being applicable, if it's a capital case versus a non-capital, that simply it doesn't exist when you look through the case law. There's no lessened burden for the defendant. There's no heightened burden on the state to show why a case should be joined. It's still the same standard that's applicable. And time and time again, even in capital cases, the courts have found that the defendants have not met their burden to show that a complete severance is mandated. And I think, and, and we've gone over this, and I know this was in the state's brief before, but when we're looking at the purpose of joint trials, joint trials are favored for multiple reasons. One is they serve the interests of justice by avoiding the scandal and inequity of inconsistent verdicts. They also enable more accurate assessment of relative culpability. And the courts have noted that sometimes that actually operates to the defendant's benefit. In addition, they promote an efficient use of the court's resources, as well as the time and resources of the government and witnesses. And finally, they prevent gamesmanship because severing defendants has the effect of randomly favoring the last tried defendants who have the advantage of knowing the prosecution's case beforehand. And that came from United States v. Contreras, and it was citing to Richardson v. Marsh. So the Contreras citation is 216 F SUP 3D 299, and Marsh is Richardson v. Marsh is 481 U.S. 200. So when we talk about severing and what the paramount interest is, that case nicely outlines it. Oftentimes we see it as a challenge of judicial economy. Um, has the defendant overcome the very fav the favored look at judicial economy? Uh, and that is the reality that we are faced with here. This is currently set to be a 10-week trial. We are talking about a severance resulting in two potential 20-week trials, or a total of a 20-week trial between the two. There is a chance, if it's severed, that that could be shortened a little bit, but we still have the same obligation with jury selection and going through that. We still would be presenting very similar cases. We would be using similar witnesses and evidence, if not identical, in, in these cases. And that's why the courts have said, especially in conspiracy cases, it is favored that we hold uh, trials together. <clears throat> 
The one other thing that I think was addressed, and it was addressed more, I believe, in response to the court's question uh, regarding the Bruton issue, but I think that is important to talk about here. The defendant has essentially indicated there could be some statements made by Alex Cox and some and or some statements made by the co-defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell, that he would wish to use in his defense. Uh, there are two things with that. When we look at the Bruton issue, the state still maintains there is no uh, confession at this time uh, to have the court review in camera. The state is very cognizant of the Bruton requirements, and if at any point that became apparent, we would absolutely notify the other parties, and we would be in, be in a different position here, potentially. And I say potentially because even if there is a Bruton issue, it doesn't automatically mandate a severance. And actually, in State v. Beam, the Idaho Supreme Court um, ended up deciding to impanel two juries to hear a trial. So again, the court is given broad discretion in determining how they can remedy uh, any presentation of prejudice short of actually severing the trials. And in State v. Beam, um, the dual jury procedure was employed by the trial court to avoid prejudice to the two defendants for the reasons of judicial economy and to avoid the problem of the rule in Bruton. And that... um, That citation is 109 Idaho 616. And what they did in the Beam case is when there were going to be any Bruton statements made, they excused one of the juries so that they would not hear that and apply it to the co-defendant. Ms. Blake, let me just ask, because, I, again, I am not familiar with the evidence in the case, with all of the evidence that would be presented at trial I asked Mr. Pryor whether or not he thought we were going to have a Bruton issue in this case if the case remained tried together for the two defendants. Do you believe the evidence is going to raise any Bruton issues? As it sits now, no, Your Honor. The state does not see any Bruton issues. Okay, thank you for your response. And when we look further at that, um, the courts have gone on to say Bruton isn't necessarily just if there's a confession. Uh, It deals with the confrontation clause and the admission of a um, of a potential co-defendant's out-of-court statement. Yeah, testimonial statements is how they. Yes. That, I guess in Crawford. And I think that's an important distinction to make because uh, the courts have determined that the confrontation clause is not violated by the admission of a non-testifying co-defendant's confession with a proper limiting limiting instruction, um, where they could redact uh, the other co-defendant's name. And that came from Richardson v. Marsh. Again, that's not exactly where we're at, but it just shows that there are other things that a court can employ short of a full severance. And then when we look at, um, and, I, and I think, again, we get back to it becomes important to know exactly what statements the defendant is talking about and how those may have any kind of bearing on any prejudice that could result to the defendant in the case. Because right now, we're simply left guessing at which, at exactly which statements he's talking about and or if there's any statements that have not been turned over to the, to the state in discovery, we haven't been able to evaluate those. We are unsure if the defendant is referring to statements he knows about that the state has not been privy to. At this point, we're looking at the statements that we've provided in discovery and we see no issue um, that would, a brutal issue that would result. I think part of that is there is this uh, appears to be a presumption by the defendant that he would get to use statements that were made by Alex and or um, Lori that as um, however, I guess what the state is unsure is what exception to the hearsay rule he believes that those would come under. When we talk about a co-conspirator statement, I think case law and the rules of evidence make clear that those statements may be presented by the state after the state has shown that they actually were made in furtherance of a conspiracy. But they, but that goes to the statement of a party opponent. Ms. Vallow Daybell is not a party opponent, nor is Alex Cox. They are named co-conspirators. If a statement of one co-conspirator is admissible, it would be admissible against all co-conspirators. And the case law makes that clear. So based on the defendant's argument, the state is unclear how he believes that any statements that may be admissible against Lori, presuming that they're going to come in under the 
co-conspirator hearsay exception, if he's even allowed to get them in under that, how it would matter whether or not the trials were severed. Because even if the trials were severed, they're named co-conspirators, those statements would come in even separate trials um, from the state's read of the rules of evidence. And again, I think the burden is on the defendant to show how it's going to result in prejudice, and that simply hasn't happened here. Not only are we unclear what the statements are, we're unclear that they would come in as evidence, and then we're unclear how they wouldn't come in in separate trials even, considering that we're dealing with co-conspirators here. Um, and then finally, I, I, on that note, I think there is kind of an indication that Ms. Vallow Daybell, there is an argument that the defendant would be barred from calling Ms. Vallow Daybell as a witness if the trials aren't severed. And I think the court in United States v. Edelin, and I think I provided that, but it's 118 F SUP 2D 36. I think that provides a spot on analysis. Um, very similarly, a defendant argued that he would be barred from calling his co-defendant. And the court went through um, an analysis of that and basically said, there's no guarantee that the co-defendant would testify even in a separate trial. They still have their Fifth Amendment rights. And to think that they may come in and implicate themselves um, was somewhat far-fetched is essentially how that breaks down. And they essentially found in Edelin, the defendant fell far short of meeting any burden to show prejudice or to even show that the co-defendant would testify if the trials were separated or that the co-defendant's counsel would allow them or advise them to testify if the trials were separated. So I think, again, we're, we're falling short here without having an evidentiary hearing and without knowing exactly what the defendant wants to present. The state's um, belief is the defendant simply falls short and that that isn't a valid argument for consideration before this court given the fact that Ms. Ballo Daybell also faces um, the same charges, well, almost identical charges, as well as has the death penalty currently pending in her case. And then I think um, on the dealing with sentencing, and the state does recognize that that is brought in here as essentially a separate issue, but the state would point the court to Kansas v. Carr, 528 577 U.S. 108. In Kansas v. Carr, the Supreme Court reviewed a case in which two co-defendants were sentenced jointly in a capital case. The court reviewed uh, some of what was brought out as problems or things that came up in the sentencing phase that each side felt could have been used against the other party. The court uh, found that the co-defendants have antagonistic theories of mitigation does not suffice to overcome Kansas's interest in promoting the reliability and consistency of its judicial process. Limiting instructions, like those used in the car's sentencing proceedings, often will suffice to cure any risk of prejudice. To forbid joinder in capital sentencing proceedings would perversely increase the odds of wanton and freakish imposition of death sentences. So the, the Supreme Court in Kansas v. Carr actually took the opposite position of what the defendant is presenting today in saying they actually thought if we severed the sentencings that that's where you would end up with results that were improper. And again, it goes back to those limiting jury instructions and just how powerful the courts and how much weight the courts give to those because we have the presumption that juries will follow jury instructions. And so the court has that broad discretion to employ and give the proper jury instructions in order to cure and or limit any prejudice that may actually result from it. Um, in so far, and let's see, um, in United States v. Catalan Roman, and that is, 376 F sub 2D 96. It um, again finds for a variety of reasons the current weight of authority remains against severance of multiple defendants, even in capital cases. And the court also finds that the same considerations of efficiency and fairness to the government and possibly the accused as well that militate in favor of joint trials of jointly charged defendants in the guilt phase must remain generally in play at the penalty phase. So again, uh, a court finding that the same standards are applicable in the penalty phase, and again, we should look at efficiency and fairness in determining whether or not a severance is actually necessary. 
In United States v. George, which I've cited to before, the defendants were arguing that they felt they should be given different sentencing hearings. The court basically said at at the point that they were looking at it, it was premature to make that decision because they hadn't heard even what evidence was going to come in to make a determination whether or not separate juries um, should hear these sentencing arguments. And then in... United States v. Catalan Roman, again, uh, looking at that case, I think I gave the wrong citation for that. It is 376 F2D96. They cite to a host of other cases in which the courts have decided to hold sequential penalty hearings. So we have the limiting jury instruction as a possibility, and then multiple courts have gone on to simply hold sequential sentencing hearings if they are concerned about prejudice. And they provide the whole litany of those. What we see the least amount of in looking through the case search or what the state found the least amount of was any cases where they actually separated the the penalty phase. And one of those was the case that we cited to Green, where there were the two shooters. The court provided an analysis of why separate penalty phases would be appropriate in that case as well. However, it essentially became a non-issue because the court determined that a severance was necessary in the penalty or in the guilt phase as well. But it is clear that severance is still disfavored even in the penalty phase if there are other remedies available. And then one other thing that the defendant touched on today um, is the imposition of the death penalty on a man versus a woman. What the state would point out is If this is an issue, if this does exist, what the defendant has failed to do at all is link that to have any bearing on whether or not defendants are tried together. Everything cited by the defendant in his brief dealt with the sentencing for capital defendants that did not have a co-defendant, or at least not a co-defendant of the opposite gender. So what we're left with is just a blanket statement that severance may help this or that prejudice could result if the cases weren't severed for the penalty phase. However, there is absolutely nothing to back up that being tried together or separate would have any bearing on that issue. If it is, in fact, an issue and it exists, it exists independent of these cases being tried together. The state's position has been that these cases are properly joined for trial. I don't think there's ever been a challenge that these cases are properly joined under Idaho Criminal Rule 8. This court has found that these are properly joined under Idaho Criminal Rule 8. So we are simply left with this prejudicial argument under Rule 14. As the state has repeatedly said, as the court has pointed out, the defendant bears the heavy burden of showing that there is manifest prejudice of such a nature that requires nothing less than a severance. I think the defendant has not met the burden at this point in time. I think we are left wondering a little bit about what evidence he is referring to. But again, any evidence, even if he is to present evidence, I think case law makes clear when it isn't a zero-sum game, it is not truly a mutually antagonistic defense, and there are other remedies available short of a complete severance. The state doesn't have anything additional unless the court has any questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. I don't have any Further questions at this point? Mr. Pryor, this is your motion. If you'd like a rebuttal argument, you may. Judge, I want to point out that um, the heightened reliability that I referenced in my brief, it was the, the Lockett case, 438 U.S. 586, is not limited to uh, uh, motions other than severance. That heightened reliability is also addressed and, and applies to severance cases as well. And when you're talking about a death penalty case, there has to be heightened scrutiny of the actions and, and, and the manner in which this case is conducted. The state keeps going back um, to the fact that I'm not disclosing information and I'm not providing a defense as to how I'm supposed to proceed in this case. And I don't have to. I don't have to tell anybody how I'm defending this case. Mr. Archibald and Mr. Thomas don't have to tell anybody how they're intending to defend this case. But as an officer of the court, I understand that there are significantly different defenses that are going to be asserted during this case. The manner in which I proceed is going to be diametrically different than where Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald plan on going. 
but I don't have to provide the prosecutor with that information. I'm not required to. What they're required to do, if the court deems it necessary, is to provide any statements that they intend to use. And it's not confessions, it's statements. It's a very broad uh, reading, or at least it's not, not a broad reading, but it's a, a very broad statute judge that defines that the prosecutor is to provide statements to the court. And I'm asking the court to, to order the prosecuting attorney to provide these statements they, they intend to use from Ms. Vallow, Mr. Daybell, and quite frankly, Judge, um, uh, Ms. Blake touched on the fact that at least one of the co-conspirators was Alex Cox. At least that's what I seem, she seems to be suggesting. But when I read the, uh, the grand jury indictment and I read the complaining documents in this case, um, Mr. Thomas tried to clarify that as to who exactly are these other co-conspirators. Well, I don't know who these other co-conspirators are. I don't think Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald know. I know they know, or at least they think they know. Uh, but, Judge, quite frankly, they ought to be ordered, and we tried that in a bill of particulars, to get specific information as to where this and where they were going with this. So if we want to talk about a guessing game, the guessing game is, folks, who are these co-conspirators you're talking about? Let us know. So what I'm stuck with, Judge, is I have a bunch of statements that I think they're going to use. And if they're going to use those statements, Judge, there's going to be a confrontation clause issue. And that confrontation clause issue, and it becomes a, a, a disagreement between Mr. Archibald and myself or Mr. Thomas, is going to cause conflict. And when that conflict occurs and Mr. Daybell's right to a fair trial is compromised because the court's excluding information that is as it pertains to Ms. Daybell, we're going to have a problem and we're going to be starting all over again. So I guess at this point, Judge, I'd like a list. I'd like the court to consider ordering the prosecuting attorney to provide us a list of all the statements of Mr. Daybell, Ms. Vallow, and whoever these co-conspirators are that they claim they uh, know so that I can take a look at this, the court can take a look at this, and let's use some, some, let's use some caution before we go down that road. The other concern, Judge, is this, is the prosecuting attorney is correct, and in my brief, I acknowledged that, that just before they even made that argument today, that many of Alex Cox's statements, testimony and non-testimony, will come in under 804, uh, a deceased declarant. But there are going to be other statements and other statements that are going to be applied that may not fall under that hearsay exception. And if those are issues that affect Ms. Vallow, I am fully confident that Mr. Archibald's going to do something to limit the, uh, the admissibility of those during the trial. And we're just creating a monster. We're creating a monster because this is going to be an evidentiary dance between balancing Mr. Daybell's right to a fair trial versus Ms. Vallow's right to limit uh, prejudicial information. Uh, the idea of giving a limiting instruction, as Ms. Blake seems to suggest, um, goes right to my argument of gender stereotyping. She may be correct, Judge, that a vast majority of those cases were not a husband and wife who were joined and they, they convicted the, uh, um, the husband and let the wife go. But it's an alarming number of cases where a male has been ordered to be executed and a female has not, and it's disproportionate. And it doesn't matter whether the cases are joined or not. If we're providing information and suddenly we get into this limiting instruction to a jury saying, folks, you don't get to apply this to Mr. Daybell, but you get to apply this to Mr. Ms. Ms. Vallow. And folks, you don't apply that to Ms. Vallow, but you apply it to Ms. Daybell. And folks, these statements really would only be uh, applicable to, to uh, Alex Cox if he were here today and he wasn't deceased. Uh, this is going to create a monster, Judge. And, and the reality is this, is that regardless of this high burden that she keeps talking about, the bottom line is this. The bottom line is that Mr. Daybell is entitled to a fair trial and complete and provide a complete and material defense to these charges. And I'm going to ask the court, and I'm going to I'll finish up here quickly. I'm going to ask the court to take a look at the Holmes versus South Carolina case, 547 U.S. 319. And it provides us some insight into how complicated these issues can become and how difficult this case 
potentially could become if these cases aren't severed. I am going to ask the court again. I've asked it in the beginning, and I'm going to ask it again. Judge, I would like you to order the prosecuting attorney to provide me, Mr. Archibald, Mr. Thomas, a list of all the statements that they intend to use for each statement's documentation, whether that's email communication, whether that's text messages, whether it's phone calls, whether it's phone records that they intend to use in the trial in this case that, that are specifically assigned to either Mr. Daybell, Ms. Vallow, or whoever the other, whether there's one co-conspirator, two co-conspirators, I have no idea how many co-conspirators they have. Uh, I'd like to be enlightened, but uh, I, I would ask the court to order them to provide uh, that information to the court so we can have a hearing. All right, Mr. Pryor. Um, based on your comments there, I think we kind of expanded some of the arguments that were in support of your motion. I've reviewed the charging language in the indictment. It certainly does name Alex Cox in there as a co-conspirator. Also, the two defendants that are charged currently clearly are co-conspirators. I'll give the state a moment here to confer. All right, Ms. Blake, do you want to make any response to the uh, subsequent request here that the court require the state to provide statements and information regarding certain other, I guess they would be at this point, uncharged co-conspirators that have been alleged by the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, just briefly, what the state would indicate is the defense has copies of all statements that the state has in our possession. We are providing ongoing discovery if anything new is learned or obtained, and so the defense has possession of those. This particular issue has already been determined by the court when the defendant brought the motion for the Bill of Particulars. This appears to be a, another attempt to get a second bite at that. This court has already denied that. The state has not been required to produce our theory of the case, and that is in essence what the defense is asking for, is the state to produce our theory of the case, any statement that we may intend to use, and in what capacity we may intend to use that. As the state has already indicated, and as case law makes clear, when we're dealing with conspiracy cases, the presumption is that the evidence will be essentially the same against the co-defendants, which is part of the reason that joint trials are so highly favored when we're dealing with conspiracy cases. In addition, the defendant or the defense appears to be using the term statements to include absolutely anything that was said to anyone. And when we're talking about, and I think the court already touched on this, when we're talking about Bruton and we're talking about testimonial statements, I think the courts have gone on to define those and make clear that they are in custody statements, statements made at grand jury or in other, in some other formal proceeding may include statements made to law enforcement, but it's not just any statement that may be floating out there. And so I think we need to differentiate that as well. In addition to that, I think the defendant made the statement or the defense made the statement that they are not required to turn over any statements to the state. The state wholly disagrees with that. There is a discovery request that has been provided to the defense. If the defense does, in fact, intend to rely on witnesses or specific statements, those have not been provided to the state at this point in time. So I think we're actually in the in opposite here where the state may have outstanding discovery that hasn't been provided by the defendant if, in fact, there are statements over and above what the state has provided in evidence to the defense. And so with that, I think... Any motion for the state to provide anything additional is improperly before the court today. It wasn't properly noticed up, but outside of that, it was addressed in a bill of particulars hearing um, a little about a month ago and denied. And so I think this is just an attempt to do that again. And again, the defense has the discovery available from the state at this point. Judge, I'd like to briefly respond if I may, please. Okay, Mr. Pryor, you can have a final response there. I want to clarify that I understand my obligation to provide discovery to the state, and I've provided some discovery in terms of reports and other items. Uh, I'm also required to disclose them statements. What I'm not required to do, Judge, and I think the state is misunderstanding my argument, is I do not have to tell them what my defense is. Now, there's a difference between the Bill of Particulars and the hearing that we have today. Under, under the two rules that apply to joinder and severance, in those particular statutes, Judge, there is a reference to the requirement that the state may be ordered, and it is a may at the court's discretion, turn over statements. It doesn't say in court, 
It doesn't say out of court. It doesn't say testimony. If you read the rule that's in the state, in the statute, Judge, as it applies to joinder and severance, Judge, there is a requirement if the court decides to do that or to order the state to turn over those items to you for you to evaluate and determine whether there's going to be a prejudicial effect on a, 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 tr a joint trial. And what I'm asking, Judge, is read the statute under joinder and severance. And it specifically references the state's requirement to provide you with that information. What I'm asking is to follow the statute and exercise that option that the court has, which is you may order them to do that. I think in the interest of caution that the court ought to order the state to provide all of those statements and say, listen, these are the things we're going to use. Mr. Archibald has pointed out in other pleadings that there's two or three terabytes of evidence, and there's a significant amount of evidence. And although I don't have to know exactly where they're going, if in fact they're going to be presenting statements, and that's a broad word, Judge, under the Joinder and Severance statute, statements of defendants or co-conspirators, whether they're alive or not, or others, they still have to be afforded me under the statute to look at and determine whether or not there's going to be a potential problem. That's part of my argument. The other argument is that there is a significant amount of information from another state involving criminal charges that Ms. Vallow is facing over there, and that if her brother who was alive would be facing over there as well. And that's going to be part and parcel of what I'm going to be presenting to the, uh, to the court and to the jury. And this idea of 404B, I would ask your clerk, your, your assistant, to look at 404B and look that that is a burden and a requirement that is imposed on the prosecuting attorney. I'm allowed to present evidence about, to witnesses about their conduct and their behavior if it, if it reaches the level of bias or otherwise. And I do not have to notice it up and do that. And, and if, if, the, if they can show me a statute that requires me to do that, I'd love them to do that. But at this point, Judge, I'm asking the court to order them to turn over those in, that information per the Joinder Severance Statute that requires them to give the court an idea of exactly where they're going with these so-called statements and information. Relief from prejudicial Joinder, yes. And I'm sorry, Judge, I didn't address it specifically. I apologize. Not today, Judge. Thank you. No, Your Honor. Thank you.